Computer memory is composed of ones and zeros, on or off, high voltage, low voltage. So how does that system get used to then represent not only all the whole numbers, positive and negative numbers, um, but also numbers with decimal places? So that's what this video is going to be about. Now, what will be really helpful to understand is first uh, what's known as a radix number system. And you may never have even heard that term before, but that is, that is actually the number system that you are familiar with. So this system uses the positions of digits to specify information about the magnitude of those digits. For example, um, we've got sort of an abstraction of a number represented across here with the decimal place right there. Uh, the ones place is just to the left of the decimal place. So if there's a five in that position, that means you add five to zero to get the total value of this number. After that is the tens place. Now, if there's a five in that position, you don't add five to get the total value of the number, you add 50. So if we have five and five, you'd add plus five plus 50 more. If there's another five over here in the hundreds place, you're gonna add 500. So the position of the five determines the magnitude that it contributes to the overall value of the number. And smaller is to the right, larger is to the left. So if we're going to the right of the decimal place, suppose there's a five over here, well, that only contributes um, 0.5, a half, five tenths to the value of the number. Now, in the middle of this slide here, we have this mathematical representation of a radix number system. And a lot of times the epsilon, the Greek letter here that looks like a capital E, can be intimidating to people. But all that letter means is that you're adding up a series of values together. Now, what are you adding in this case? Well, to the right of the epsilon is d sub i times 10 to the i. So the d sub i stands for the digit in position i. And with our representation of our number up here, we've got um, well, I'm going to start in the middle and go left and then go back to the middle and go right. So we've got d sub 0 to the left of the, the decimal place, d sub 1, d sub 2, and so on up to some whatever digit we go up to, d sub n. And on the right, we've got d sub negative 1, d sub negative 2, d sub negative 3, all the way over to d sub negative k, whatever we end up with on the left side here. So that's the number in that position, but it's not just the value of that number right? 123, the value of that is not 1 plus 2 plus 3. It's 100 plus 20 plus 3. So the digit in position i is multiplied by 10 to the i. 10 to the 0 for the 1's position, 10 to the 1 for the 10's position, 10 to the 2 for the 100's position, or for the decimal places, 10 to the negative 1 for that first position after the decimal place, 10 to the negative 2. 10 to the negative 3 for the 1,000th place. So that's what this, no, this uh, notation in the middle here is representing. And some questions that I want you to think about uh, are, well, what would you change about this above formulation to do it in binary? And also, um, why? So our number system, the number system that you're familiar with, is base 10, because it's easy, because we got those 10 fingers and toes. Um, in binary, what would we need to change? And we'll get to that in uh, a subsequent slide here. So now I'm gonna show a few different number representations. And in all of these representations, we are looking at the value of the number 2001 in, so 2001 for base 10, right? So when I say 2001, I mean the number that you're thinking of in our, our base 10 system. The little subscript right here, this little 10 down below, is indicating what number system it's in. If this was a little two, well, I mean, it wouldn't be 2001 because we'd be in binary and there wouldn't be a twos digit. There would only be zero and one. But that's the idea. If there was a two here, it would be binary. If there was an eight here, it would be in octal. If there was a 16 here, it would be in hexadecimal. Okay, so um, let's actually start with decimal right here, the system we're familiar with. So in decimal, we have the one representing one times 10 to the zero. Uh, the next zero represents zero times 10 to the one, the next zero, zero times 10 to the two, uh, and then the two itself represents two times 10 cubed. So 2000 plus zero plus zero plus one. 
gives us 2001. And so that's pretty familiar, hopefully. How do we represent this same number in binary? Well, actually, let's let's actually go octal binary, and then we'll talk about hexadecimal. Um, so in octal, you have eight different numbers. Now, why would anybody use that? Well, because it's um, a power of two, so it makes it a little bit easier to convert from binary. So octal is mostly used with computer systems. I don't know of a good application outside of computers. Since computers use ones and zeros, everything's nice that's a power of two, octal's a power of two, we can do a more easy conversion between binary and octal. But again, the idea of octal is there are only eight digits. Eight is not one of those digits. It's zero through seven. Think about decimal. The number 10 doesn't have its own digit. It has two digits to represent it. Same thing in octal. Okay, same thing in any of these. Binary does not have the number two among its digits. Okay, so back to octal right here. Well, the number 2001 in octal in base eight would be represented by 3,721, or I probably even shouldn't use 3,700. I shouldn't be using thousands, hundreds. I should just say 3721, okay? Because the ones place is going to be this one times eight to the zero, same as one. The ones digit is gonna look the same in all these different radix number systems. The two is representing two times eight to the first power. So we're adding 16 to the value of this number because of the two in this position. Next up is the seven. It represents seven times eight squared. Uh, the three represents three times eight cubed. You add all those values together, you get 2001. So basically the lowest digit in octal represents uh, whatever that number is times eight to the zero next times eight to the one, next times eight squared, next times eight cubed. So each time the exponent goes up by one. So that question in the previous slide of what would you change about uh, decimal to make it work in binary, binary is you would change the base of the exponent, which is what you can already see here. I know there's a lot of numbers right there, but if you can you know, either pause the video or, or just you know, parse that information, you see it's, two to a power. Each of these digits, whether it's a one or a zero, is multiplied times two raised to a power. The same way in octal, base eight, each of the digits is multiplied by eight raised to a power. So finally, let's do binary. I'm not gonna do this in excruciating detail, I hope, um, but this is the number, I'm not even gonna read it off, the many ones followed by zero one, zero 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 one there represents 2001. We need more digits to represent 2001 than we need in base 10 because we're only adding in powers of two, right? So for a larger uh, number of digits, you need fewer of them to represent each number. There's a trade-off there. So the very first one in the binary representation, well, multiply that times two to the zero, which is the same as one, and it contributes one to the value of, of our ultimate number. Now there's a bunch of zeros in a row there, so each of those powers of two just get multiplied by zero and don't contribute anything. And then the next one here in the two to the fourth position, so it contributes one times two to the fourth added to our number. So that's an additional 16. So basically you gotta add up these numbers in the bottom row of this first set of three, uh, and you will add those up and get to 2001. Now hexadecimal might even be the weirdest of these notations uh, to your brain because it has more digits than we're used to. It has 16 total digits. Now you can see the letter D right in here. You might be like, well, that's not a digit. Well, but in hexadecimal, it actually is, right? So we have additional digits in hexadecimal. Counting in hexadecimal goes 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E. Oh, I lost count. F, I think, is the last digit, is, is the value of representing 15. Uh, and then it loops back around. I hope I did that right. It'll be on the, the next slide anyway. So the one in the first position represents one as it does in every Radix number system. Uh, the D in the second position represents 13 times 16 to the first power. And the seven represents seven times 16 to the second power. Add those up, you get 2001. Okay, so here's just a table showing the conversion between different number systems and it kind of uh, loops. So it, it you know goes down this table and then loops back up to the top over here. Uh, I think they wanted to do that so that the hexadecimal actually made it 
all the way around, right? So um, zero is represented by zero, all these systems. One is represented by one. After that, it changes. In binary, there is no number two. So it's represented by what looks like a 10, but don't pronounce it that way. Maybe say one zero. Because when you add one to one in binary, you actually need to round up, or, or not round up, you need to carry. You need to carry over to the next digit. So one plus one, well, we don't have a bigger single digit. You have to carry over to the next digit and end up with one zero. Add another one. Oh, well, that's okay. The one fills in right there. Well, now we have one one. Add another one. Oh, now we're in trouble again. One plus one, we'll have to carry over a value. Okay, well, then we have to add another one plus one. We have to carry over that value. And now we end up with one zero zero. So it's actually very logical to add in binary. If you know how to add in decimal, you know how to add in binary. It's just whenever you're like, oh, I would have two. Instead, you have to say, oh, you know what? I have to carry a one over to the next position. I think that's pretty much all I need to say here. Also in this table, you can definitely notice the fact that hexadecimal requires fewer digits to represent larger values because it has more digits to use. You got more digits, you can represent larger values using fewer of them. You have very few digits, as in binary, then you have to use more of them to represent smaller numbers. So this is where this um, uh, very old joke comes from. You can't really pronounce it out loud. It's not meant to be pronounced as there are 10 types of people who understand binary. Or yeah, there are 10 types of people, those who understand binary and those who don't. Because in binary, you know, would you really say 10? 10 is not really accurate. Let's just say one zero. It represents the number two. Now, if you read it as there are two types of people who understand binary, uh, those who, sorry, I keep doing it wrong. Those who understand binary and those who don't, uh, that, well, that's the joke. <laughs> All right, next slide. This comes from uh, XKCD number 953. You can see the link there at the bottom. Um, on a scale of one to, again, you can't really read it out loud. Is she saying one to 10 or one to two? How likely is it that this question is using binary? Uh, he says four, she says, what's a four, right? In binary, well, I mean, I guess, I don't know, you would still, yeah, you wouldn't really pronounce it as four, right? You would pronounce it as one zero zero, I suppose. And then the alt text, I actually like on this question. So the alt text is, is listed at the bottom here. Uh, it says, if you get an 11 out of, well, again, how do you pronounce it? Let's call it 11 out of 100 on a CS test, uh, but you claim that it should be counted as a C, they'll probably, de they'll probably decide you deserve the upgrade. Um, so what what is the joke there? So 11 out of 100, if we're in our regular number system, is dramatically failing. But if it's in binary, the number 11 represents 3, and 100 represents 4. So you got a 3 fourths. So you got a 75%, which is a C. Okay, so how do we convert from uh, decimal to binary? <clears throat> so the way the conversion works is a series of divisions. And we want to keep track of the results of our division and also the remainder. I'm going to use my arrow again as, as best I can to point things out here. So we're starting with um, 1,492 in decimal in our standard base 10 system and we want to convert it to binary. So what we do, oh, and I'm sorry, I cut off the equals 1492 here with my image of myself in the corner, but that's what that is right there. That's 1492 right there. So anyway, what we do is we take 1492 and divide it by two. Now the result of that is 746 with no remainder. The no remainder, the zero remainder, is going to become the first digit of the binary number. In fact, all of the remainders will be our digits, but we have to keep track of the result of the division to keep further dividing until there's no more dividing that we can do. And that's what this uh, column is representing. So whatever number you're trying to convert to binary, you're going to divide it by two, and then you're going to divide the result by two, and then you're going to keep dividing. So anyway, we divided 1492 by two, got 746. The zero remainder becomes the first binary digit. Uh, we have we take 746 divided by two, remainder, or sorry, 
result is 373, remainder is zero, zero becomes the next digit. Now, when we divide this number by two, it's odd, right? So we are going to have a remainder of one. That remainder, whether it was one or zero, goes down and becomes the next digit. This process is continued. Oh, and also when we say our result here, um, the result has to be a whole number, right? So we'll take our remainder, it goes down to be the digit. The, the rest of the division, the, the quotient of the division um, stays in this column over here. We would never say 373.5 and then do that division again. Um, we'll say, or sorry, we would never say 186.5. We would say 186 remainder one. And then what we're dividing the next time is the 186. The remainder one went and did its job down here as, as one of the digits. Anyway, so you get all the way down to one What's one divided by two? Well, it's you can't divide it without a remainder. So there's remainder one. So the final digit will be a one. The, the largest digit, excuse me, will be a one. And then we're done, right? There's nothing further to divide at that point. And that's how you convert from decimal to binary. So how do you go the other direction, right? How do you convert from binary to decimal? I think that this is actually rather a lot easier. If you know you skip back to earlier in the video where you had the Radix number system, you can probably already work out how this calculation is made. I don't think this page is actually the most clear about uh, demonstrating it. All right, so this is one way to convert from binary to decimal. I don't frankly like this way very much. I think this is kind of confusing. There's this successive doubling method. Um, where they start with the highest digit right here on the far left. I'll use my arrow. They start with this. Um, and since it's a one, so okay, great. And then you have one plus two to the zero. That result goes up and is gonna be multiplied by two the next time, plus we're adding in the binary digit, the next binary digit, which is zero. So zero plus two times one. That results in a two. The two gets carried up each time the, the result that you get is going to be carried up to the next line and multiplied by two as you add in these binary digits. I think that's unnecessarily confusing. Um, if you go back to the Radix slide, uh, let's see, let's go back to this one. I think this shows a much simpler way that you can convert from um, binary to decimal just using a loop, right? Just loop through the digits from the low digit on the right uh, low digit on the right to the high digit on the on the left and each time uh, take your digit multiply it by 2 raised to the power of the index index 0, index 1, index 2, index 3 right? it just goes up by 1 each time and add all those together it's a summation I think that's a much easier way than this successive doubling uh, method of uh, converting from binary to decimal but hey here's an alternative Okay, so the next thing is, that was all fine and good. That's, you know, binary and decimal and all that's good stuff. But what about um, values that have decimal places? Now, these are referred to as floating point numbers. When I was saying decimal before, I was referring to the number system that is base 10. The DEC, DEC in decimal, is for 10. Floating point is numbers that have this decimal place, right? And then digits after the decimal place. How do we represent those? Computers uh, have a limited amount of precision in the numbers that they can represent. Can't represent pi because pi has an infinite number of decimal places. Only a certain number of digits can be represented. So this, this slide is sort of getting a little bit ahead of ourselves here, but it's going to help us lead into how these computers uh, represent these floating point numbers. So ask yourself, suppose that you only had three digits available to represent numbers. Uh, what, how would you use those three digits to represent as many different numbers as, as you possibly could, right? Oh, sorry about the image artifact there. I don't know what exactly happened. Um, hopefully, no, that definitely shows up on the video. That's okay. Anyway, so here is our number that we are trying to represent. Now, with floating point numbers, we're going to represent it as some number f, which is often referred to as the fraction or mantissa. It's kind of a lot of vocabulary in this. 
Sorry about the image artifact. I'm not sure how that happened. Multiplied by 10, which is referred to as the radix. Yes, same radix as radix notation from before. Raised to an exponent, e. Now the 10 is just going to be understood to be 10. The only two numbers that we need to store in our computer system are the mantissa, f, and the exponent, e. And you'll see how we can represent a, a wide variety of values uh, in the floating point number system. It's actually very clever in my opinion. I, I quite like this. All right. <clears throat> so here we have some uh, numbers. Let me get my arrow again. So here we have some numbers along the left side. We have three digits of pi, 3.14. We have a, a small number uh, with a bunch of zeros after the decimal place. And we have 1941. How can each of these be represented in that floating point representation? Well, there's some consistency right here, right after the equal sign. We're just going to say 0 point and then a number. So 0 0.314, 0 0.1, 0 0.1941. Some of this you might say, well, that's kind of silly. I mean, we already had like the whole numbers. Why, why would we shift the decimal place? And the answer to that is for consistency. Okay. As long as we are uh, storing a number in a consistent manner, we're going to worry about where the decimal place should float to uh, with some additional values that will be stored in memory. Um, we need that consistency, right? So for some numbers, this will be really convenient, right? If we were storing literally 0.1 or 0.314 or 0.1941, that would be convenient. For other numbers, it's less convenient. So again, that's, that's like a minor trade-off and, and doesn't really affect the representation, but it might seem odd that we're like immediately shifting the decimal place <clears throat> rather than sort of keeping it where it's at, but the consistency is actually very beneficial. Okay, so the 3.14, we'll, we'll start with a representation with a decimal place to the left of the first non-zero digit or the most significant non-zero digit, and then we'll multiply by 10 raised to a power. So in this case, 10 raised to the first power to get 3.14. And there you can see it written again over here. Sorry, I didn't line up my equal signs. How about this number, which has five zeros and then a one? Well, we take 0.1 and we multiply it by 10 to the negative fifth. Um, or we take the 1941 and multiply it by 10 to the fourth. And so in this way, we can store in memory just two things the number of relevant digits after the decimal place and the value of the exponent that they're multiplied by. And with only storing those two things in computer memory, from there we can have a consistent calculation to how to translate that into a number with decimal places. When it talks about a signed uh, decimal, we're talking about whether it can have a positive or negative sign. And I kind of wish we would deal with that as a separate issue, but um, basically one of your binary numbers in memory, a one or a zero, is going to be occupied with the responsibility of determining if the number is negative or positive. Zero in that location in memory if it's positive, one in that location in memory if it's negative. And then from there, the rest of the memory that's dedicated to storing whatever our number is, part of the memory is going to be allocated to storing the digits. And we're just going to assume that those digits are right after a decimal place for consistency. And then the remainder of the memory dedicated to this number is going to be storing the exponent. Now I know it's like after the decimal place, but like imagine it's just 314 converted to binary. That's essentially what it's going to be in the memory. We're going to just say 314 converted to binary. That's what's stored there. Um, the one here converted to binary, the 1941 converted to binary, and then the rest is, uh, the rest of the memory is dedicated to, again, a whole number. We're just going to convert it to binary. One, negative five, four. The negatives we hadn't really talked about before, but like I said, it's just a single one or zero in memory that's dedicated to whether the number is positive or negative. Now that gives us actually a rather large amount of uh, ability to represent a large range of numbers, which is what, what this section is talking about down here. Suppose we only have um, 
Yeah, so they're saying assigned decimal in the range from 0 0.1 to 1. They're saying we can only, suppose we can only represent some number between 0 0.1 and 1, which is not actually the way I would prefer this phrasing. Um, I would say, imagine you can only represent three digits, like 100 is what they're representing here. And then also two digits of an exponent, assigned exponent. So you can represent like negative 99 to positive 99. Well, that means you can go from positive or negative 0.1 times 10 to the negative 99th, or same thing, positive or negative 0.1 times 10 to the positive 99th. Oh, I think that should have been positive. I believe that's a typo, sorry about that. Negative 99 here, exponent, this one should have been positive 99, I think. Or should they both been positive? I'm a little bit confused by my own slide, sorry about that. But that is a vast swath of numbers, right? From 99 zeros, to 99 zeros after the decimal place is an enormous range of values that can be represented. Now, the downside is that there's gaps in the representation. You can only represent three digits, right? So can you represent um, 999 followed by, what, like 96 more zeros? Yes. Can you represent 9999 nine, nine, and then any, you know, let's say 95 uh, more digit, more zeros. No, because we can only represent those first three nines. The rest we have to assume are zeros, or the rest, the algorithm that makes this calculation based on the information in the memory would assume those were zeros. So there are large gaps in the range of values that floating point can represent. But the power is that there's also an enormous range of values that it can represent. I'm going to say that again because I'm worried I tripped over myself as I was saying it. There's a large, very large range of values that can be represented by this floating point system. But there are also significant gaps of numbers that cannot be represented. That's the trade-off. Okay, next slide. So what I was just saying there about the gaps in the representation is a little bit what's trying to be represented here, although I think imperfectly. So this, this uh, diagram that we have here, so zero can be represented, um, but then there's a little bit of space between zero and the next larger positive or the next uh, more negative number. There's some gaps where numbers cannot be pinpoint represented in that range. And this, uh, so if it's above, it'd be negative underflow. Below, it'd be positive underflow. And then there's a bunch of numbers that can be represented. But I think the dot right here, the dots right here, are actually very significant. The gaps in the representation in terms of how wide they are, like if we subtract, if we took the difference between two numbers that could be represented, especially as we get up on the higher range, the difference between those values is a larger value. The magnitude is larger then it is closer down to zero. So there are gaps in the representation. And then like beyond, uh, oh wait, I'm sorry. No, they have the negatives on the left here. I'm sorry, this is a number line. This isn't like, I was getting used to like the digit zero in the middle and then the um, decimal digits on the left. Um, sorry, this is a number line. The negatives are on the left. So negative underflow, that makes more sense. And the positives are on the right, positive overflow. Um, then there's also just the highest possible number that can be represented because there is still a largest. I'm not gonna go through the bullet points here as I think I find them to be a little bit even more confusing than just than just talking through the slides themselves. Okay, let's go on to the next, next slide here. So this goes through um, some of the terminology used in the previous. Um, I just wanna talk about the fra fractions, the mantissa and the exponent here. So the fraction, again, is, so we have a certain amount of memory, say 64 bits dedicated to representing a floating point number, a double if you're in Java, for example. You have 64 bits. Some of those bits are dedicated to representing the fraction or mantissa, the numbers, the particular digits that are gonna be in our number that we will see when this number is converted to a decimal value for display on the screen. Some of the bits are dedicated to representing that, including one bit for positive or negative, and the remainder of the bits are dedicated to representing the exponent on the 10. So we'll take the fraction as 0 
that number converted from binary to just like an integer, but it's actually zero point and then that number, multiplied by 10 raised to the power of the exponent, whatever the number is that the exponent, originally just a binary to decimal conversion, but put that whole number decimal, put that, yeah, that decimal whole number into the exponent of the 10, perform that calculation, that's the number that gets displayed on the screen. If the exponent is negative, again, one of the bits in memory for the exponent section is also dedicated to whether the exponent is positive or negative. If it's negative, well, then that decimal place moves to, I got to reverse myself. Let's see, this is my left, so that's your left, moves to the left in the number, right? Uh, if that exponent is positive, it moves to the right in the number. And so we can float the decimal point. That's where this, uh, this, where this name comes from, I believe, the floating point name. The more bits in memory that are dedicated toward the fraction or mantissa, the more digits, non-zero digits, can be represented. The more bits that are dedicated to the exponent, the wider the range of numbers that can be represented. So again, there's this important trade-off. So here, for example, uh, is a number in memory with uh, the decimal place is a little bit misleading. We got to be a little bit careful with that. It's not a decimal place in the sense of a decimal number in our base 10 system, it's really just dividing up the sections dedicated, the sections of the bits dedicated to uh, the different components of the number. So we have the sign, one digit, one bit for whether the number is um, negative or positive. And here we have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bits dedicated to the exponent. So any number between zero and two to the seventh minus one can be represented, or well, that's the number of different numbers because the exponent can also be positive or negative, uh, can be represented here. And then the remainder of the bits are dedicated to the fraction or the mantissa. Uh, so here we have some, some values on how many bits are actually dedicated to various numbers, right? So single precision or floats, if you're in Java, for example, 32 bits, doubles, uh, doubles that precision. You have twice as many bits dedicated to representing such numbers, 64 bits. And then there's some extended precisions with like 80 and so on. Uh, so here we have one bit, uh, uh, this is a 32 bit. So this is for the float. So for the float, one bit dedicated to whether it's positive or negative, eight bits to the exponent, 23 for the fraction, uh, the, the digits themselves. For the double, one bit for whether it's positive or negative, 11 for the exponent and 52 for the fraction. Uh, and this is showing um, not only that same information of how many bits are dedicated to the different sections and the total bits, um, but also sort of what are the uh, largest and smallest numbers that can be represented, what is the range of values as well. So doubling back just briefly, unfortunately to my slide with the, um, the little image artifact right there in the middle, the basic takeaway is this. Floating point numbers are still represented with just ones and zeros in memory. Certain of those ones and zeros are dedicated to representing what's called the fraction or mantissa. In fact, I shouldn't have gone quite so far back. Right? So certain of those bits are dedicated to the fraction or mantissa. I actually decided I like this slide best. Other bits are dedicated to the exponent. Then there is a process that the computer runs and says, okay, take, take that fraction in binary, convert it to decimal as if it was just like an integer, except we're gonna treat it as if the digits of that are right after a zero point. So zero point and then whatever uh, we calculated from the memory of the fraction, times 10 raised to the power of the exponent, again, just converted to an integer. So if we can do binary to decimal, we can do binary to a number with decimal places, a floating point number and this is how it's done. So thank you, I hope you enjoyed the video, and good luck, good programming.